class? Some of the people, there were 12 of us on the plane going over from SFO. And uh, if you paid up, if you were smart, the new business class uh, on China Southern Airlines uh, was um, uh, great big seats that practically you could almost sleep because your feet come up. Now, if you were a cheapskate like me, then you sat in the regular seat, which means you got to get up uh, every hour. It's good for you to get up uh, and talk and, and learn about the flight. So, you know, going over that far, the Great Circle route takes you almost to Alaska. It's just phenomenal how far north you go and you come down and surprisingly, maybe not so surprisingly, uh, the rest of it's going to be slideshow, but I just have one big old map. Uh, you know, somehow, well, the pilot likes to miss North, uh, North Korea, excuse me. Uh, they, just, they just bypass that. And you can see the plane does a, uh, you know, little, little maps on the back of the seat. It does a, a skirt around North uh, Korea, uh, goes between Japan and Korea, down into um, Guangzhou, uh, which is just up the Pearl River from um, uh, from Hong Kong. So you go almost to Vietnam. It's it's about 12, a little over 12 hours. We had about a four-hour layover, and then another four hours. Uh, so it's a long trip there and back, but it's very interesting. Uh, up to uh, Nepal. Now Nepal doesn't show that well. Well, Jim, can you come a little here? So um, Nepal is a long, skinny country down here. And it's traditionally been a great buffer between the two big powers of India uh, and China. So uh, the people there are just these phenomenal people. Uh, about 75% are of Indian descent. On our, uh, yeah, right, cool. Thanks, Jim. Um, Jim, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jim. Uh, you know, so they're about 75% Indian descent, and of course they're Hindu. And the 25% are uh, a Buddhist approximate. And that's it. Uh, no Muslims there. And, and I just, you know, I just, I asked about that, and they don't want to talk about it. They are just, these two people get along really well and they haven't had any fighting or anything like that. So, you know, they, they're just good, good folks. And uh, you, as you'll see here, they are some of the toughest people in the world. They can climb up those hills. You just can't believe how. Uh, resourceful they are with an economy that just has, you know, very little going for it. Subsistence agriculture, uh, tiny little patches of land that they have, uh, you know, the hillsides. They they'll they'll uh, grow stuff any place they can for survival. So the, our tourist business is, is really appreciated. Uh, the other big business they have is reparations from their soldiers. So they have phenomenal soldiers known as Gurkhas. The Gurkhas uh, have been in the part of the British Army for 300 years, and every war they have been with the, us allies. And, and I didn't, wasn't able to put the picture of uh, the latest um, uh, medal winner, but they have a um, uh, a fellow who, in Afghanistan, saved the whole U.S. Uh, platoon from ambush because he went right up a hillside uh, with weapons and grenades. He and a, and a partner and just wiped out the Taliban, kicked their butts right off the hillside. That's how these tough these guys are. It's just unbelievable. So anyway, uh, I'll tell you, we'll talk more about all that sideshow stuff. But uh, let's go on and get on. Oh, you see this box here? That is our uh, water treatment plant. It is a um, uh, made in Colorado by a Rotarian who is a, is a fellow who could be a future Wright Brothers. He, had, he and his brother put together these machines that um, uh, are, have all these components and General Electric donated a um, state-of-the-art water purification operation that's the, the heart of it, 5,000 gallons an hour, an hour. And for the first time, the main hospital in Kathmandu has clean water. It, it is not amazing that people have survived all those years but they don't live very long, uh, even though they're tough. There's all kinds of bad stuff in that water, far, far worse than anything you'll see in Latin America. I mean, we're talking about uh, cholera and typhoid and things like that are, are common there. So uh, 
you know, they have immunities that people do to the normal uh, dysentery and stuff like that, but uh, the water issue is so critical. So we were happy to, uh, to uh, help out on that. See, so Mike, what do I do here now? <laughs> What's the forward? Forward. Point it at the computer. Point it to the computer. Oh, point it at the computer. Oh, my God. Mm, there we go. That's not a slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Here. 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 Okay. Here. 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 Okay, how about that? Okay, so uh, this is just a typical street scene right in front of the of the Helping Hands Hospital. The new, this is the uh, the new hospital that's just being completed, uh, and this is the typical street scene, uh, chaotic. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Where's the hospital? Uh, well, we're going to get to that if I can that's figure it. out. Okay. Uh, uh, now that's a typical construction site. Uh, sorry to say, I'm going to show you the bad news and then I'll show you the good news. So, moving on. Um, so, uh, John Kaufman on the right is our man from uh, Redwood City uh, Rotary. The fellow with the, with the peaked hat is the head doctor and director of the Hospital Foundation. And he's pointing out the, at the new wall going up. And you can see the construction issues, Jim. I uh, know you do love, love this, and I'm going to show you more of this. We'll go through this. Anyway, that is the traditional Nepal hat. Um, here's a from the sixth story, the new hospital. Uh, typical street scene down there. Uh, if we could have audio, uh, there was a, a, a Hindu wedding going on down below, and all day long we had music that lasted all 12 hours. One day we were there trying to finish this job. But we'll, we'll go ahead, Mike. Um, another street scene from the top of the new hospital. We were up six stories. This is a construction scene inside the new hospital showing how they mix the cement right on the floor and they never get it all up so therefore they have left over. Any homeowner here who has ever mixed concrete on your floor, you know that then you've got to hire some guys to come and chip it off, right? So that kind of thing is, is, is set. It's very sad. Uh, here's our group, uh, along with some of the Nepal people. Um, I don't see me in there. It doesn't matter. Right, right, right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, and these are <laughs> these are some of the folks. Uh, there's John Kaufman and his um, fiance, the blonde gal, right there on the left side. Uh, here is a um, reception for in the old hospital. Now, a, a block away is the old hospital that we're going to be replacing. So just to show you the conditions, we can click through this pretty fast. Here's the uh, admissions, people lining up. Here's a, uh, a room where you get a procedure, which I'm not going to explain, because that is so scary. And you wouldn't go there for anything. I tell you, I couldn't. This is the operating room. Uh, look at the trash on the floor. Uh, this is the, some of the patients waiting uh, to get admission. Uh, keep, uh, OK, here's one of our people, this gal here, Diana from Chicago. Not everybody was local, about half local, the rest of scattered around the U.S. with the talking to this little old lady here. She's waiting to get treated. There's a little, that little girl was phenomenal. She sang for us. We're, we uh, uh, socialized with the folks, uh, which they appreciated because they don't see that many Westerners. Uh, these are the poor people who, you know, just come out of, come out of nowhere. Here's the current water treatment plant. Mm. Now take a look at that, guys, and that is was so rusty and so bad, you can you know that that pathogens are breeding in that water there. You just got to know it, even if you're not a scientist. Um, here's a uh, unfortunately the lady there died while we were there. A, a person died in that room. We were there for a full day uh, trying to figure out stuff. Uh, this is a uh, recovery room, and this man here. Uh, the, uh, is crying, that's her husband. Um, and just just right there, you just life and death, it happens. Uh, ICU room, uh, moving on. Uh, patients uh, sitting outside, they get rained on half the time. Uh, an operating room, 
or in recovery, I'm sorry. And then there's women's uh, operating back in there. Um, here's a, uh, another condition here. Looking down uh, the chaotic street scene, and you'll see the telephone poles. It's hard to tell right there. But even the phone pole will have 100, 200 wires. You can't even count them all. The wires just go chaotically. They're old wires. Who knows? Um, and here's another. Each of those poles is just covered with wires. And notice that they're driving on the left side, British style. This was never a colony, but the pal was a um, was a, uh, a treaty uh, friend of the British. That's why the soldiers uh, are, are British style soldiers. This um, six by six is holding up the roof, and it's wired to uh, to that rail there to keep uh, people from kicking the roof support down the uh, stairwell. How about that for um, for wonderful construction style? Uh, here, here was the, uh, the best dressed uh, high end. It's a high end family, uh, obviously, because look how well there's the wife in the back, another daughter on the right, and the little the little boy just doesn't look too well. Uh, but they were the that was the only family that looked like they had something uh, of uh, uh, you know worldly worldly goods. Everybody else was incredibly poor. Uh, here's the uh, drugstore, admissions, or excuse me, uh, the pharmacy. You go there and you just get whatever kind of compounds they have uh, on the... Uh, there's a real good scene of the uh, wires, huh? Uh, just, you know, maybe we had a telecom person here that could explain how this all works. Uh, here's the inside of our, um, our sunscreen uh, machine made in Colorado by a brilliant guy, Jack Hawkins, who uh, is got to go down in history. This guy showed up in Kathmandu with two of his workers, and then a whole bunch of us helped him assemble this machine. We actually worked on it for three days. Uh, one day, we were there about 12 hours. Uh, got to tell you the story. Uh, here is, uh, okay, Mike, coming up. Uh, you call for labor. We had six of these big tanks we had to pull up. But you call for labor to help. And instantly, there'll be a dozen guys show up who you don't want to make a buck. And uh, boy, do they work hard. Uh, and they appreciate it. Uh, we pay them right cash, right on the barrel head, so to speak. Moving along. Uh, here's a one barrel came up. Uh, here's the machine uh, top. Uh, we've got solar power, wind power. Uh, that's because the power outages, it is wired. Um, but power outages, here's it. Everywhere you see bamboo coming into the city of Kathmandu from the lowlands. Bamboo is just used, everybody, everybody knows in the Far East, it's, it grows like crazy and it does all kinds of things. Here's the completed machine. Uh, this quick story about this, there, there are eight uh, uh, bolt holes in the bottom uh, plate to hold it to the concrete floor of the new, uh, the new hospital. But we could only get in four, and so several of us volunteered to stay late that day into the night because they get great big earthquakes in that country, and they get uh, the uh, monsoon season. The monsoon season starts in July, runs for about four months, and then the typhoon comes with it. And that, you can just see what's going to happen to that big old machine uh, when the typhoon hits. Uh, so we stayed and got all eight bolts in, expansion bolts. Jim knows all about this stuff. Well, everybody does who's ever tried to fix something in the country. Uh, because we didn't have proper equipment, we didn't have really a, 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 a hammer drill, the kind that cuts like, like uh, do concrete like butter. We didn't have one, couldn't find one. So we had to use old-fashioned drills to try to get uh, holes into the concrete. And it kept on running into rebar, which is... Uh, chaotic. The re everything is chaotic, but the people are so damn nice, except that that's just their life, their lifestyle. So moving on. Uh, okay, then now we're moving, we're done working, and we're taking Air on the right there, as you can see, he's part of our group. We just took Yeti Airlines. Who knows what a Yeti is? Have you ever met a Yeti? You know, the phenomenal snowman, right? And, uh, uh, but you know, that was a wonderful little plane there. They, this is inner country. Uh, air service, the uh, Yeti Airlines. And now we're on our hike. We're now, we're done working and we're going up into the mountains. This is the first of three 
uh, rope bridges is actually cable, steel cable. The other two were way up. I mean, I'm talking a thousand foot drop. This and but even though. It's just a view, it looks like a bridge on the River Kwai when the water went down, you know. <clears throat> but back to the rope, okay, so uh, everywhere are, are water buffalo, they belong to the local farmer. Um, and just some, some uh, goats down there, you can see subsistence farming. Here is a huge water buffalo with one horn. I just thought he was kind of interesting. On the side of the road, okay, this, this kid is a porter, he's wearing my hat. And these, <laughs> These porters are unbelievable. You have one uh, head guide, uh, which, uh, which they love to be called a Sherpa, but technically only the guides on Mount Everest are Sherpas. Everybody else is just a guide. The, the Everest guys get upset if you call other people, but they love it. They love to be called Sherpas because it's just very, very prestigious. Uh, see this kid? This kid is carrying about a hundred pounds. He, he's got two full backpacks plus my little pack, uh, and he's just coming up like crazy. You can't stop these guys. What did you carry, Ken? Uh, a light day pack. And then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you saw him walking down that bridge. He had a jacket on. Yeah. And he had a beer in his hand. He was busy. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you better have that light day pack, and you better take a roll of TP. <laughs> no matter what you do. Oh, okay. Now we're jumping ahead. Here is Mount Annapurna. This was our destination. Annapurna is what they call a massive because it actually has 13 of these peaks. Uh, Annapurna 1 is the highest at 26,860 approximate. Uh, and you, of course, we didn't make it to the top. Uh, this is one of the hardest mountains to climb. Harder than Everest, even though Everest is higher. This is about third highest. Um, and this is some more of their peaks. Uh, 13 of them in the, what they call a massive, it just goes forever, but that's just part of the Himalayan chain. Um, it, this, it, this is phenomenal. It's so, it makes its own weather. It's so high and so massive that it creates its own climatic conditions. As you can see, the clouds to the right. So this picture here, stay on this one for a bit, Mike, because this was when we got three days to get to the top at 12,500 feet is where we got, uh, and we stayed overnight in uh, moving up in little um, tea houses, as they call them. They're um, owned by the local uh, farmer, subsistence farmer, and they're just basically a shack. But, and they do stop the wind, that's about what they stop, and if it rained, they, you'd be okay. Yep, yeah, Ben. Jim. Uh, ben, yeah, the, oh. okay, your room. Now, we were lucky, we paid up, and we got a room uh, about double this wide, and what you did was you opened the door and you just flopped down. And there was room for your backpack alongside. But um, he got up at pre-dawn. And this was, this, was the, this was the most impressive thing I ever saw in my life. The high point of the whole thing. My God, this is the, the reward of getting up before sunrise. And we went up the last uh, about 500 feet up the hill to stand here in front of the mountain and then watch the sun come up. So who will guess, uh, as the sun rises to the east, of course, which would be to the right, and which direction are we looking right now? Sorry. We're looking north, of course, yeah. And who will guess where the sun, for, on the mountainside, and this is the unbelievable scene, where does the sun first hit? Who will point to the spot where the sun first hits as it's coming up? Yeah, exactly right. So, Jerry, you'd be in a flyer, he wouldn't understand that. So, the sun's below the horizon, so naturally when it comes over the horizon, it starts at the very tip and then walks down. And that it blows your mind, because you, I've never seen anything like that before. And to see it is just, um, uh, it's just amazing. Say, so, you know, all this hike up here was worth it, was really worth it. Uh, how many this days, is Jerry, you know, how many days to get up three days up uh, from the 4,000 feet to 12,5, so we, we uh, acclimated. Uh, and I had a, a drug too uh, to help, uh, <laughs> Diamox. <laughs> uh, Diamox, is my, I have a brother, a physician, a brother who got me a prescription. Uh, and you stop right away when you get, when you stop climbing. You don't take it anymore. It does help you, you absorb more oxygen apparently, 
didn't have any side effects. Well, I used to, when I skied in the old days, even, even heavenly at the top of, I'd start getting a little woozy up there. Uh, and this 12.5 would be, um, but uh, uh, nobody got sick up there. We all, we all had Diamox, and you got to have a dysentery thing. You don't drink the local water, and be really careful about what you eat. Never, never have ice cubes and things like that, but somehow it still gets you. And when it gets you, you got to run to a tree. <laughs> and this happened, and it, it is a little embarrassing, uh, but everybody knows, and nobody worries, and we're half women too, and the gals had the same problem we have. And you don't know, you don't look, you just, you let them, well, you stop though if you have a people walking with you. But as you, you, as the day works on, people, some people are moving way ahead, others are lagging behind. Um, so there's always somebody around, and the, and the porters are always there to help you. They can help you out, and if you can't reach your TP, they'll get it for you, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you want to buy them beer. So they have beer for sale at, at, the, uh, at each of these uh, tea houses. The reward, when you get there around 5 to 5.30, is each day we got about, we got ended up, everybody caught up and got to the tea house. And you got to have a beer. And the beer is so good after you've been walking, even though it's about 50 degrees in the daytime, got up to maybe 55 Fahrenheit. It's hard to tell with the temp because it's, everything, is, of course, is Celsius over there. But at night, and at first thing in the morning, that could have been close to zero. We don't know how cold, but it was damn cold. Uh, right then at that point, so it goes from uh, sub-freezing uh, uh, up to 55 or so in, this, in the, uh, the shape of a day. And of course it can be a lot warmer towards the summer, but then the monsoon starts. And you don't want to be there in a monsoon because I, I mean, I wouldn't even have, I don't know how in the world you'd ever get up there. But, um, but you can see how cold that was just by the, uh, everybody's, uh, uh, this is just a small part of our group. We're scattered across the hillside. A couple people couldn't get up uh, in that early in the morning. We had to wait for them. They were feeling the effects of, of the, uh, mostly dysentery is what knocks you out. Uh, then you get a, a good breakfast. The, the tea house though has dinner, which is always dull pot. You gotta have dull pot. That's what you eat. That's what they eat, and it's rice and and local vegetables all boiled together. And you know it wasn't bad because you're you're pretty hungry, uh, and it's boiled. That's important. It's boiled, but dull pot. Uh, well, right now I don't want any more rice and veggies for <laughs> for a long time, man. You just see. I hate to say this, but you do see that rice uh, for a couple weeks of healthy rice. <laughs> I won't, I won't go any further down, down that road. So, uh, but anyway, um, okay, well, this is the nicest building in Kathmandu. I, uh, these are out of order, I'm sorry. I just had to take a picture of a very nice building because they had a terrible earthquake three years ago uh, and just re still rebuilding. It takes forever to rebuild. Uh, moving on, Mike. And I think we're going to be at the, um, at the Monkey Temple. It just shows the, the pollution, uh, even water, everything uh, turns green immediately and it's so hard for, for them to keep up on stuff like the monkeys drink out of that. Now we're up at a, the monkey temple is the main a religious site in Kathmandu, up on a big hill, moving on there. And um, yeah, this is what they call a stupa. A stupa is a Buddhist uh, a holy spot or prayer spot. Not necessarily a holy spot, but the small ones are solid. As they get bigger, there's a, a place to go inside and, and, and say a prayer. Uh, this, move on, that's an ugly guy there. <laughs> there's a monkey there. The monkeys are everywhere. Moving on, Mike, you might as well just click through these. Um, here we go, this is an important one. I, oh, I got in trouble, I did a, a local food pub. Uh, there's a man in front, see the man with the white shirt and the green and the blue sweater. He turned around right after I took this picture and saw me and, uh, and he told, he gave me the evil eye. He watched me for a solid 10 minutes around this very large complex because I did, I took a picture and I think 
what he was mad about was that the crippled lady on the left, that was part of his group, and he was watching out for them, and he didn't think that was right that I took that picture. He told my group, he saw who I was with, a bunch of Westerners. And I, I apologized profusely over to him. I went over and, and uh, uh, but he was was uh, somewhat forgiving, but not completely. And you know, you don't you don't want to do that. You don't want to be the ugly American. And I just didn't realize it. I just thought it very colorful. The the uh, uh, Hindu dress. Uh, all the monkeys there at the temple. The temple is a combination of Hindu and, and Buddhist uh, religious site. Uh, very very uh, ancient. These are prayer wheels, this is Buddhist. And you, what you do, you have a mantra, and you move along, and you spin each of those wheels up on top. Uh, and you say the mantra, and you know, after you're there, you, you get the idea that this thing really does work. It gives you such a positive attitude. Uh, and the people are so, uh, they're just wonderful. Actually, what else can I say about they're wonderful? Um, some more of the, uh, the, the people that were so well dressed, uh, here's inside of a stupa, and there's a fellow there collecting some money on the right. You come in there and you say a prayer, but I think you need, we didn't go in because we didn't know what to do and all that. Um, here's another, a larger stupa, and want to move to the next one, Mike? Um, what you need to see is the eyes that are looking out. Maybe the next one has the eyes. Uh, shoot, this didn't turn out very well. Now there's a reclining, um, a Buddha, he's about 14 feet long. They like reclining Buddhas for some reason. Uh, but Mike, want to go back, uh, go back a couple. Uh, okay, now the eyes, you can't, uh, okay, you just see the tops of the eyes uh, right there. There are two eyes there, and they do that on the, uh, uh, the all-seeing eye is everywhere in, the, in that part. It seems like the all-seeing eye. He's got it. There we go. Uh, and it's, it's a, um, I can't really explain the, the background, but it's very interesting that they, the all-seeing eye. And, and you know, the Masons picked that up, you know, and our dollar bill has the all-seeing eye, right? Uh, so, uh, that, that's just everywhere, and I guess it keeps you straight or something, huh? You know, you don't want to mess around if, it, if you got some eyes on you, right? So, um, we need more of those here. Yeah. So, well, this was a, 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 a beautiful day. Now, look how blue that sky was. There you go. Now we're really seeing the eyes. Uh, beautiful day, this day, but most of the days are so overcast with dust. During the dry season, the dust is everywhere in the air, on you, on the cars, anything that sits overnight. I mean, I'm talking about cake with dust. Just absolutely cake. Uh, clear day. Uh, moving on, my here we go. A view down to Kathmandu from the hillside. Is an Indian couple at our hotel. Uh, very well dressed. Had to take their picture and talk to them. He spoke perfect English. Part of our group at the airport, I think. Uh, okay, here's coming home. Um, on the uh, port side, okay, we're flying out of Kathmandu, heading back to Guangzhou. So we're south of the of the uh, of the mountains, uh, and. You look out the, the port, the left side, and you, you see the whole, not the whole range, but whatever you're going by. And on the right, one of these mountains was identified by the um, flight attendant as Mount Everest, which is to the east of Kathmandu. Our hike was to the west of Kathmandu by, that's why we took that Yeti Airlines, to Pokhara, about 300 miles west. But coming home, uh, you get to see the, a good part of the rest of the, um, of the mountain chain of the Himalayas. So each of those might be like a massive, that might be the Everest massive. Uh, and now we're maybe three or four hundred miles south of the, of the mountains, but they're so incredibly huge that it just, thank God it was a clear day. And this is just out, you know, like the window of the airplane. Might want to move to the next one because I think Everest is on the right side. It might be that one, but uh, anyway, the steward has told us that we're passing Mount Everest now. So, uh, it, that was another thrill. I thought I had seen all the thrills, but it, it, there's no end to the thrills. This is the box that it came in. There's the Everest on the right. There you can see the, how huge that is. And, uh, you know, uh, so the real camp, here's something interesting. We're, we were trekkers, right? 
We didn't have any ropes and didn't need oxygen tanks or anything like that. But on the trail, some people shot past us, some very wiry western looking people, <laughs> with a whole bunch of porters carrying oxygen tanks and lots of ropes. They were the real climbers. And they were going up to Annapurna and they just shot past us like we were standing still. They were heading to base camp. Base camp on Annapurna and Everest are both at about 15,000 feet. So uh, my oldest son, Mike, and um, Dion met, she gave, she gave him a mortgage renewal a number of years ago. Uh, and, my, and my brother Ed, the physician brother who gave me the Diamox, have both been to Everest Base Camp. Uh, they didn't try to climb it, but that was, it took about a week to, just to get there. Uh, and that's at 15,000. Uh, so uh, Ed, uh, my brother, told me that when he got there, immediately, they knew he was coming. Immediately, they got a bunch of sick people. There's maybe a hundred people at base camp. Not all of them are going to climb. A lot of them are just uh, just using that as a, uh, okay, we got five minutes left. So I want to get to some questions too, but uh, the Everest Base Camp or the Annapurna Base Camp is an objective onto itself. But then the real climbers are also there preparing to go up. Uh, but uh, three girls uh, were there who were not prepared for 15,000 feet. Um, they may be helicoptered in. Some people do that if you got the bucks. Uh, and so immediately it's called into action. Is there a doctor in the house kind of thing? These gals were, were uh, near death, he thought, that they were in bad shape. He ordered, he gave them some, whatever he had, um, I, I didn't, he didn't tell me what he had, maybe the Diamox or something, and then ordered a helicopter, get these gals out of here right away, down, back down to Kathmandu. Um, because, you know, the best thing for altitude sickness is to get out of there and just get low. Um, but I guess, um, I guess they were not getting breath and they were uh, not able to stand up, not able to eat, couldn't take care of themselves. They were basket cases, could have died. Uh, so, uh, and, and Ed, Ed and my, my son Mike said it's a real mess up there with trash. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the hikers and, and the, uh, the climbers uh, just leave their, their stuff. Uh, they're just too tired to take their stuff home. And so they have to have big uh, groups of volunteers go up and, and try to clean up the place. So, um, uh, you know, any, let's, let's go into some questions here and, and stuff because we ran through these pictures real fast. Yeah, Bob? I hear that you uh, were a record, uh, you're a record holder for something. Yeah, okay, so what we got to uh, the top, uh, um, what do you call it? It was called Poon Hill, uh, where our final destination. Uh, and, and it was, you know, around six o'clock, we went to our second or third beer and our head guide spoke perfect English, educated in Britain. Uh, you know, he's just a phenomenal guy. He could go anywhere and make a good living. Um, but he brought all of his, uh, all of his porters. We had about maybe six porters for the 12 of us and the head guide. So he says, he's, he wants to give her an award for the oldest guy to ever make it to that point. So I got that award, whatever, you know, <laughs> who knows. got to get in shape. Of course you got to get in shape. And Jim knows I was walking almost every day from uh, low level up to, towards 280 and back every almost every day. And it uh, got to a point where before I left where I wasn't even winded. Uh, Jim saw me early on and I was doing okay, huh? Yeah. Yeah, but okay and it got better. You, you had me worried though. Yeah. <laughs> so when you said you were worried then I redoubled my efforts and you know you, after and your while, wife was twice as worried as I was. Yeah, yeah for sure. Oh, no, all, all, the whole family was worried. Yeah, Tom? What were the dates of your trip? And did you see oh, well, last week, uh, we, we were 11 days total counting travel time uh, at the end of February, so just a month ago. Okay. Yeah. How much money, do you, do you know how much money this system cost that you uh, installed? All our donations all, to our clubs yeah. and all the other clubs. You know, it's really murky because so much is donated. GE. They, the heart of the thing is a tube inside there that has this, these nano filters, uh, and it's a, they have the patent on it, but they've donated a bunch of that. But I think somewhere in the $100,000 range, 
could be if you really put a retail price on this thing. Do the filters have to be changed? Uh, not for five years, the, the main filter, every five. Wow. There's other maintenance, monthly maintenance that they are very simple, mostly flushing out. Uh, we then have a valve for that. Flush. Yeah, and um, so the technology uh, is in uh, it's a state of the art kind of thing, 5,000 gallons a day. So it can get down to 0 0.02 microns. And if there's any scientist in here who knows what a micron, you know, like a millionth of an inch of a meter, excuse me, or a thousandth of a meter, I guess. A micron would be thousandth of a meter. So 0 0.02 microns is small. They captures even viruses. So that water is in, was, is clean as you can get. The cost from the manufacturer is twenty thousand dollars each for each unit. Oh, oh, look at this mic got it. So okay, right but it, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, that's if you buy them uh, retail. Is that right? The cost buy? to make them. Cost to make them. Okay. Yeah. Um, shipping, shipping very expensive. Yeah. What, what happens in five years when they have to replace? The oh. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the filter I think can stay, but it has to be maintained. There, there's maintain a process. There? Say again? Who will, who will maintain it there? Who will, who will uh, I think we're going to have to go back. Somebody's going to have to go back. Yeah, in the meantime. Yeah, but was this a rotary matching grant? Uh, there was, yes. So uh, that's a matching grant? Uh, oh, I don't know if it was matching or not. I don't think it was matching. It was a rotary, definitely a rotary grant, but each of us, um, out of pocket, uh, was I. I, I was out of pocket probably about forty-eight hundred dollars personally. Five hundred of that was a pure donation. Okay. To, so we each uh, we wrote two checks. One was a pure donation. The other was for all the expenses of us getting there. Yeah. Were the Mountain Springs water drinkable or those polluted? Uh, you don't drink anything, right? The, you know why? Because the animals and the people, and they dump, and there's no sewer. And there's always a little tiny, the villages aren't really villages. It's just one or two farmers, uh, not even a crossroads. It's just uh, people living near the trail. Yeah. And of course, they make a living on the trail, too, because they'll sell you. For example, uh, the beer was great. The beer bottles they sell there are the size of, um, of a wine bottle. Uh, and you can just go through them just like crazy. You're so thirsty, of course. You um, and the local beer is wonderful. What was that called? Uh, I think Yeti juice. We called it Yeti juice. <laughs> uh, but they had uh, European beers in it. So uh, it's five bucks for a beer. And the reason it's so expensive, you know, you gotta, somebody's got to haul it up there, right? And it comes up, uh, you know, by porters and, and on uh, on the. Uh, uh, he's got to go to work, I know. John had to go to work. So it comes up on a mule. They got mule. Uh, I didn't see any donkeys, uh, but definitely horses, mountain horses. Oh, here's another important part. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. I was going to ask, are a lot of Western tourists in Scotland when you were there? Uh, uh, no, not a ton, because it's so packed with so many people. It's hard to tell, you know, but you do see Westerners there a lot. And, and at the hotel, Hotel was very clean, very nice. Uh, supposedly a five star by their standard, but uh, to here it'd be a two or three, you know. But that's fine. You know, you weren't there for the hotel and uh, it worked out well. But uh, coming down, I got to say that uh, I was fine going up, wasn't really exhausted. Um, uh, the, the dysentery, though, it does hit everybody and that does wear you out. You need some refreshment. You got to drink of water all the time, and beer at the end of the day is a reward. But um, yeah, well, incidentally, that was that beer at five bucks was five hundred rupees, hundred rupee to the dollar, just a general thing, and five hundred rupees, you know. Uh, but back at the hotel, it was even cheaper than that. But they got to haul it way up there. Um, but coming back. Uh, I didn't fare so well. Of the 12 of us, uh, four, including myself, um, got locked knee. So you're stepping over boulders all the time. And uh, you're extending your knees. Uh, and my knees got to a point about halfway down where I couldn't bend anymore. I actually could not bend my knees. So our, our head guy, our Sherpa as we called him, uh, he, he got on his um, satellite powered cell phone. There are no towers up there, but he's got a satellite. And within 20 minutes, we had horses. He called to the local, 
local farmers, we need four horses. And in 20 minutes, they're there. Now, it, it cost me a liter of 50 bucks extra, which I was happy to pay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this horse, these, these horses that, that I got on were like war horses. I mean, they had ankles like this. No thoroughbred Arabians. These are tough horses, and they, they, they are born and raised up there, and they know the way. But after you get on, there's no saddle. It's a blanket and a rope in the front and the back. <laughs> and you're sitting on there, but you're doing this. You're holding on to for dear life. Because it's still, you know, it's a 30 degree drop or so. And you got to be pulling way back and all this stuff. And at the end of the day, your tailbone, I mean, I was bouncing up and down. I had a sore tailbone for two weeks. <laughs> um, just from bouncing with no saddle. And the, here's, the, here's the worst part, though. I, I got to give you the worst part. Is that the horse knows what they're doing, they know the trails, and they don't like the big boulders, they like the smaller ones. And as the boulders roll down the hill and clog up the trail everywhere, they go to the edge, because it's nice and soft over there. And guess what's looking over to your left side when you're coming down like a thousand foot drop? And the horse is just walking right on the edge. So my worst issue was at one you know, you know, intellectually you know that the horse knows what he's doing and don't fight it except emotion can take you over it was a lesson there you know what i did i started leaning inboard and then the uh, the guides or the porters saw me leaning and i started to slide and they had to stop everything and straighten me out and tell me, don't do that, don't do that. But then I, then I didn't, so I had to, you know, this is a life lesson. And it, you know, you're, you've got to control your emotion all the time, right? Well, the lessons, I wish I would have learned that a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> don't fight it. Yep, yeah, so anyway. All right.